Thank you for coming to New York on the day of the jobs report, which everyone has been so focused on, waiting to see if wages continue to accelerate and boost this sense of more rate hikes in 2018. Right. Now, we didn't get that. We just pulled back a bit if you look at average hourly earnings. But a big gain in payrolls. What signal for the economy, for inflation, and Fed policy do you take from this report? Well, I thought it was a really good report. Uh, obviously, 313,000 uh, jobs created on the payroll basis. We've had very strong uh, payroll growth for uh, many, many months now. Um, state of the labor market is vibrant. Uh, clearly, the unemployment rate at 4.1% continues to be good. I would say that uh, the increase in the labor force participation rate is a really good sign. More people are coming in to the workforce. The unemployment rate is sort of, you know, continued to stay at that 4.1% rate uh, that ends up being a good uh, sign on the on the heels of the 300,000 uh, payroll employment. Uh, you mentioned wage growth was a uh, little on the weak side and so this is one of those uh, interesting developments that even though the job market is very strong we still haven't seen really strong uh, wage growth. I'm looking forward to stronger wage growth uh, in the future. I'm looking forward to all of these things leading to a stronger economy and stronger inflation more in line with our 2% inflation objective. I think we're on a pretty good path. So where do you tilt more towards, Charlie? Because you've talked about both aspects. You're looking at, uh, what, two and a half to two and three quarters percent GDP this year. I think you've mentioned recently could even be three percent. Right. But you keep saying, hey, inflation is still below target. It's core PCE, one and a half percent average for eight years. Right. With a jobs report like this, does Charlie Evans say, well, you know, I I'm, I'm getting more on board with a March rate hike than I was when I dissented on the December hike, or even in February when you expressed the same kind of caution? Well, I think the economy is doing very well. I think it's likely that inflation is going to pick up, and so that's a good thing. On a tactical basis, I can see the merits of arguments where, you know, we continue our gradual increase uh, in rates. What sort of tips it for me, at least as I'm thinking about this, is uh, at a more strategic level, I think that the uh, long period of inflation below our inflation objective uh, has been very difficult. It's been associated with difficult times. and. Uh, the time that we spent at the so-called zero lower bound was just really painful. So the funds rate was very close to zero for, you know, so many years, and that was a sign that the economy wasn't performing as well uh, as we wanted it to. In the future, you know, at some point, years from now, the economy is going to have a difficult spell, and if we go into a recession, normally the Fed has to lower the funds rate by 500 basis points. And so I think it's very important that we have as much monetary capacity to respond to that difficult time as possible. So I think it's very important to ratify 2% as a symmetric inflation objective and that markets have inflation expectations truly consistent with our objective. I'm nervous that they're too low, and I believe that just by um, being a little more cautious, waiting to see if the March inflation data come out uh, in a better way relative to a year ago, that could be helpful for us. So uh, you still feel that if you're, you'll be urging your colleagues, you don't know for sure, meeting in two weeks, you'll be urging your colleagues to think about waiting to raise interest rates, waiting till June to make sure this inflation, you know, gradual uptick in wages and inflation is going to be sustained. Is that what's, what you're going to say at the table? Well, I think we're going to have to wait until we get to the meeting and see all of the data and put our forecast together. But I do think that there is merit to the argument that, you know, waiting just a little bit longer to be absolutely sure that the inflation data is going to move, that it's not going to be uh, sort of uh, overwhelmed. I mean, we've had a lot of uh, disruptive technologies and uh, mergers and, you know, one-off kind of things work their way into the inflation data to, to keep it down. I think there's good reason. Six-month inflation has been uh, averaging 2%, so on a 12-month basis, we ought to get an improvement as time rolls on. But I'd like to be extremely careful. We're not really that far away from getting that data, so we'll see how it goes. Does a, a jobs report like this, very strong payrolls growth, Wage inflation that really hasn't, deceler hasn't accelerated, in some ways it slowed down just a bit. Does it kind of put a stake through the heart of the Phillips curve? I mean, the whole idea that, oh boy, the tighter the labor market gets, the, you know, the, the less slack you have, the more you're, you're going to have to see inflation. You've been sort of skeptical of the Phillips curve. Does this really raise even more, show that this is 2018? It's not like 1978 or 88 or 98, even 2008 maybe. 
Uh, all of those are good points. I do think that uh, you know resource slack is something that has an effect on inflation, and as we uh, get to uh, more pressure on resources, that ought to exert some upward pressure on inflation. But I think that those effects would be measured as pretty small unless we continue to have uh, uh, very uh, strong growth and greater reductions in unemployment. The fact that wages haven't picked up does make you wonder a little bit about that. But, you know, there are lags in the transmission of, you know, from labor to wages to uh, prices. And so I think we, you know, have to just assess that. Okay. Um, you've said that the, the Fed can wait till the middle of the year and still do a total of three or four rate hikes in 2018. I said they could. They could. Now, they not could. that they would, that they could. But that seems to imply that the Fed could raise rates in between meetings. Are you in favor of doing a press conference at every meeting? Would that be, would, the, would that give the Fed more flexibility and more ability to kind of have this cautious approach at a time when you point out it's so needed? Well, that's a very interesting question. Now, the chair has been, uh, doing press conferences, um, I believe, at least uh, since 2012. So we have uh, six years of experience uh, with doing quarterly press conferences. I think the Fed has been well served by that frequency. Sometimes I think, I think we, we provide a, a, a tremendous amount of information about how we make decisions. We have statements. Uh, you know, we all go out and speak and, and all of that. So I think that uh, the quarterly press conferences have definitely served us well and they are manageable. I do think, uh, I know that uh, we are set up to be able to make a different decision than people might have expected between okay. press conference meetings and then we can um, on short notice, uh, have the press call in and the chair can do a quasi press conference, certainly respond, uh, provide more information. So that's sort of normal operating procedure, but we haven't done it yet. And we have a new chair and I think uh, Jay Powell is going to uh, think and he's gonna lead the committee and so he'll tell us uh, how he's thinking about this and I look forward to uh, hearing more about that. Okay, as we continue this conversation with Charles Evans, president of the Chicago Fed, I wanna just continue to uh, uh, say I'm happy that we have our radio and TV audience so riveted on this because this is such an important time to be talking about policy and more. A couple of things, and I, let's try to see if we can hit some things fairly quickly. Some of your colleagues have talked about the concern over overheating. They've talked about headwinds turning to tailwinds. I know every central banker right now, if you ask them about tariffs and how that's going to affect the outlook, says, oh, well, not yet. It's not affecting the outlook. What if it doesn't go away? What if it escalates? What if we get something that looks more like a trade war? At what point does it concern you? At what point does it affect the path of monetary policy? Well, I mean, as an economist, I think that, uh, you know, freer, uh, fairer trade is a good thing. And I think that, uh, you know, tariffs can sometimes get out of hand and uh, lead to problems. I think that you know, the, the global business environment is just so different in how it's evolved over the last 10 and more years. Supply chains are, are global. People are moving, you know, uh, intermediate products across boundaries, uh, you know, quite often. And so uh, imposing a different tariff structure, uh, you know, makes businesses scratch their head and think about how they've uh, invested so many resources in an existing supply chain. It's just, it could be very disruptive. And then, uh, of course, if it, uh, you know, tit for tat and that escalates, that would be unhealthy. Okay. Uh, another kind of concern, uh, this is a bit more institutional. Uh, right now, the board's been pretty understaffed, the Board of Governors, for a while. And it continues to be there. We don't know when some of these seats are going to be filled. And then they're still understaffed, right, relative to the full team. Does that concern you? Uh, I do think that uh, everything works much better when we have the full complement of seven governors. Uh, we don't have seven governors now. We have three governors. And so that's uh, quite a workload for uh, the governors. The committee is uh, still quite large. But yeah, no, I look forward to uh, new governors being uh, appointed and confirmed. Okay. In terms of uh, fiscal stimulus, monetary policy, uh, there have been some raising this, this uh, flag about, you know, the, the, the White House and the Congress are trying to stimulate growth, you know, and the Fed is concerned about having too much inflation and being willing to tighten policy. That slows it down. Does that set up kind of a collision course at some point, and is that a, a concern over the Fed, its independence, et cetera? 
Well, I think earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, is is the economy facing headwinds or is it now tailwinds, right? So now we have uh, more fiscal stimulus. We've got the the effect of the tax cuts, which, uh, depending on how the dynamic aspects of this, it could be, you know, an increase of one and a half trillion dollars to debt. Uh, there's more government spending that's been agreed to, and so that really, since the beginning of the year, has added a tremendous amount of heft to uh, the outlook. I think that's incredibly noteworthy. Now, the unemployment rate's 4.1 percent. I'm extremely pleased that more people have been coming into the workforce from out of the workforce because that's extremely healthy. But there's only so much scope for more people to come into the workforce with the skills that businesses really want. And most business people I talk to are continuing to say it's difficult to find workers with all the right skills that they need for today's economy. So this, you know, does reinforce resource pressures, which is going to lead to greater cost and price pressures. It's a difficult time to have so much stimulus hit the economy as opposed to back in, say, 2011, when it would have been really helpful with very high 9 percent unemployment rates and many people uh, looking for jobs being better able to find them. So monetary policy, the job is to uh, look, assess the state of the economy and respond in order to we, so that we can support our goals of maximum employment and price stability. So at what point does Charlie Evans, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, uh, get concerned about, quote unquote, falling behind the curve, getting to a point where you haven't raised rates fast enough, inflation is starting to accelerate, then you have to, quote unquote, slam on the brakes, and also maybe the risk of bubbles, financial excesses. How do you balance these concerns? So there's a lot in that question. I would say that, um, you know, at the moment, I'm not concerned with inflation getting out of hand. I don't think we're behind the curb. I think that uh, there's a scope for us to be uh, careful and patient. We're assessing the situation. And still, by the end of the year, we can still produce uh, as many rate increases as is necessary. And I think that would be consistent with a gradual approach, even if there was some delay. You know, I would say that most of the commentary that talks about, oh, when the Fed got behind the curve was a different era where inflation expectations were out of line with price stability. They expected higher inflation. And the Fed's job at the time was twofold. It was not only to deal with a cyclical increase in inflation or an inflation surprise, but also over a longer period of time, try to bring inflation down to a lower level associated with, with price stability. We have uh, uh, solved that secular uh, challenge that, you know, from the 70s to now, if anything, inflation is much lower. And so there aren't as many additional jobs that need to be done. So I think it's harder to find, fall behind the curve. But having said that, we have to be mindful and monitor this and make sure that inflation doesn't get outsized. I think that would be a very high inflation rate. We're supposed to deliver symmetric inflation around 2 percent. That means We've, we've lived with 1% inflation, 1.5%. I mean, 2.5% can be consistent with symmetry if it's not getting out of hand. Why does the Fed have to hit a 2% target? I mean, more. Let, let's say that's a target, so you have to say you're going to hit it. But let's step back. Is it because now it's a matter of Fed credibility? Boy, we said it's our target. We're going to undermine our, our, our power and, and the people's confidence in us. Or is there some fundamental economic reason why we have to hit 2% inflation to keep the economic recovery and now growth on track? Well, I do think there's a longer uh, run strategic aspect to this. And so the Fed has uh, agreed that 2% uh, is our objective. Now, the way this is supposed to work is so financial markets will, you know, take that on board. Are they going to credibly deliver 2%? That means that interest rates ought to embody, on average, that inflation of 2%, and there should not be an inflation premium. There shouldn't be too much variability. Borrowers shouldn't have to pay for volatile inflation experiences to compensate lenders for that risk. I think everybody benefits when that's the case. But, uh, you know, a, a borrower who's paying a high interest rate, you know, it, we, you know, we ought to be delivering the 2% inflation so that it's not overly burdensome. And at the same okay. extent, lenders ought to be protected that inflation is not too high. Okay. 2018, going into 2019. But w at what point will Charlie Evans, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, I'll say it again, what are you waiting for? What do you have to see to say, okay, I'm going to get on board for three, maybe even four rate hikes this year? Oh, I don't think the question is how many rate hikes in a, in a year, because it's really the trajectory of, uh, you know, the increases. And so, you know, I think that uh, I would like to definitely know what the March inflation data is going to be to see if the, you know, telephone company data plan reduction in, you know, that uh, 
index number has a big effect uh, rolling off. We get closer to 2%. We've seen six-month inflation at 2%. I'd like to see that, you know, continue. And so then when we have confidence that we're going to be at 2%, then we can continue to increase uh, policy rates in line to renormalize policy. So, you know, I, I think that the, the strategy that we are pursuing is a good one. I think gradual increases work. I don't think we're behind the curve, and I think we're going to have uh, good discussions uh, over the course of the next few meetings.